Hi, my name is Dwayne Crawford, and I'm the Product Line Manager for Fiber Connectivity here at Belden. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the future of fiber optics and connectivity, and we're going to have a look at what some of those driving factors are. Before we can talk about what the future looks like, we need to talk a little bit about what are the changes happening in the industry that are driving the future. Well, there are really two big things that we're going to talk about here today. One is silicon photonics. Its real goal is to lower the cost of I.O. and really improve the performance of I.O. in compute-based systems. And the other one is compute disaggregation. This is going to be a result of silicon photonics, something that's enabled from silicon photonics to help reduce the cost of running a data center and actually help ease managing a data center. So let's jump into those. One of the first things we need to understand is compute and what's happening in the compute world, and especially when we talk about parallelism. So we watch Moore's Law and it, it's moving along. So we're following along on that Intel TikTok roadmap and we're seeing more and more transistors going into a compute element. So something like a CPU, GPU, FPGA, ASIC. So we're getting more and more transistors. We can grow uh, more and more parallel and that's following Moore's Law. But the problem is we hit some limitations a few years back, probably somewhere in that 2003 time range. And these are serial limitations. So we lost our ability to grow clock rate. We're really limited by the, uh, the power dissipation of the devices, kind of the, uh, what we call the V-core floor. We can't get the, uh, the, the power down anymore because of the voltages needed just to drive the silicon or the uh, silicon process, the CMOS process. So that, that's implementing some limitations. We have some I.O. limitations that have also come in. If we look at how many pins we actually have on a package, well, uh, there, there's only so much that can be done there. Even with stacked dies, you still run out of physical space to put all these pins, and you can't make a device infinitely big. So there's limitations for parallel, how much parallel I.O. we can get in and out. Lots of limitations in terms of trace and routing noise as well. So that has to do with and serial reach. So if we try to run faster serial protocols off the chip, we start to run into problems with how far can we actually run them. So the migration from the 10 gig lane rates to the 25 gig lane rates, we've actually started to see this. This is a big jump up in lane rate. And what's happened is We've had to shorten the trace length pretty significantly because the frequency is higher. So there's some, some big problems here on the serial side as well. How do those two fit together? Well, if we go back in the world of compute and we look at how do we make things run faster in a parallel paradigm, we can talk about something called Amadel's Law. And Amadel's Law tells us that, well, we can throw more parallel resources at a problem, but we're fundamentally always going to be limited by the serial portion or the sequential portion of the algorithm or of the process. So where do we live today? If we have a look at this graph, we're living down in that little red and yellow box. We can throw more and more processors at the problem, but because of these sequential limitations in the coding and the applications and serial limitations in I.O., we're really stuck with how much real acceleration we see by throwing more parallel resources at the problem. So it's a very good um, highlight of the problems, the real challenges facing the compute world today. And it's a serial problem, not a parallel problem at the moment that needs to be fixed. Let's look at architecture, for example. Let's hop over and actually see how this manifests itself in real hardware. Well, up there is a picture of the Intel uh, Phi motherboard. This is the latest, greatest high performance computing platforms. And what you're going to notice is Chips are getting closer and closer together. The, pro the separation between the processors actually has to get smaller to run at these high uh, interprocessor buses. So this is the, uh, in the Intel world, this is QPI uh, running at 8 giga transfers per second. So it's got to be less than 12 inches. That's getting smaller and smaller, that number, as it goes over time, that trace length. We're seeing the memory is actually stacked almost right on top of CPUs now. That has to do a lot with the memory bus routings. We try to run memory faster, you gotta shorten that trace length. So again, memory is almost interfering with the ability to cool CPUs at this point. It has to be so close. Then we have a lot of other buses like PCIe Gen 3. We got about a 20 inch trace length. So that's pretty long, but it's not even in the same class as PCI was years and years ago. So that's getting shorter and shorter and shorter as time goes on. So it's really limiting the flexibility in building a compute architecture. So when we look at the bottom picture there, we see that we got those copper traces in the PCB. 
Traditionally, that'll connect to the optics in some sort of SS SFP cage. And this is where we have a lot of the limitations. It's really routing in between processors or processing elements and in between I.O. elements. Now, if we want to evolve our compute architecture, what do we want to do? What's ideal for us? Well, ideally, we want to componentize everything. We want to put it in its own little box. So we want to take things like the compute, put it in a box. Memory, put it in a box. Local storage, put it in a box. I.O., put it in a box. Why do we want to do this? Well, it makes it easier to manage and upgrade these. If I want to upgrade memory, I'm not opening up a whole PC. I'm opening up a memory blade, and I can add memory or just completely swap it out. It makes it very fast and easy to execute upgrades inside a data center. So this is being driven a lot by the Open Compute Project. This is where they're trying to get to, and this is what they call compute disaggregation. So instead of having everything all on one board, we're trying to split them up a little more to make it a little more manageable. And to do this, we need faster lane rates, longer reach. It's a pretty simple uh, fix for this problem. So how do we fix it? Well, Silicon Photonics is going to have a big play. Silicon Photonics is pretty interesting for a couple of aspects. One, when we want to talk about getting the cost of compute down, silicon photonics is interesting. The reason why? Well, before we had the I.O. bit, and if we were doing uh, optical parts, we had to fab those in a completely separate fab. And these are kind of what we would call specialty fabs or boutique fabs. They run fairly low volume when we compare them to the big guys who are actually making things like CPUs, GPUs, and ASICs. So we have a very different economy of scale. It's not following Moore's law, whereas in the CMOS process, we do follow Moore's law. So if we can get optics over to CMOS process, we actually have a huge economy of scale to leverage here. We got cost starting to play on the side. So that's really interesting for silicon photonics. The other thing is now we can run optics right out of our processor, our CPU, GPU, ASIC, or FPGA, and talk between devices through embedded optical waveguides in PCBs or out through a card edge connector and actually go box to box. So we can do chip to chip, board to board, box to box with silicon photonics, and it actually becomes very realistic at this phase. We can extend high speed buses and start to break down some of those serial limitations we've been living with. Now, I've circled something over on the far right side, and that's a card edge connector. Now that we need to pick up optics off a of PCB, our connectivity is going to change pretty significantly, and we're going to have a look at how that actually ends up looking. But that's going to be a big challenge moving forward and play into what do our future connectors need to look like. The other thing I want to talk on is as we're talking more and more about running compute over fiber, we got to realize the compute runs on hex. Everything in the compute world is based in hex. Base 16, programming languages, 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, integers, long ints. All of that's based on hex. Buses are all based on hex today. They're all some multiple of 16, 32, 64, uh, 128. It's all some multiple of 16. So we got to realize that compute is naturally aligned. When I want to do addressing, it's naturally aligned for hex. I can do simple math, add one and roll over from 16th lane to the first lane of a bus. It becomes simple. Today, fiber's not aligned like that. We're talking base 6 and base 12. Six, six fibers per subunit, 12 fibers per subunit. This doesn't align well with hex. So when I want to talk about running a bus over 12 fibers, I got to get a little more creative in how we do addressing. When we want to run a bus even over 8 fibers, it's still we have to get a little more creative on our addressing schemes. So, we have some simplicity that needs to be built into the system. We got to get aligned with the compute world if we want to support the compute world moving forward. So we have what's coming up is called the base 18, 816 shift. So today everything is based on 612. Well, we're going to be moving things into 816 coming, uh, coming up in the next couple years. So you're going to start to see different fiber counts for cables. You're going to see four new colors come out going inside the cables to cover those uh, extra fibers there. So fiber 13, 14, 15, 16. So you're going to see lime, tan, olive, and magenta get introduced as standard colors. So those are some of the real things that are going to be happening very shortly to help align this new connectivity paradigm. The other thing we got to look at when we're talking about designing that future connector is where is it going to be used in the network? Well, when we talk about data centers, and that's really the big driver moving forward, we're talking two different applications inside the data center space. So we've 
shift it fundamentally to the world of a full mesh network. So that, that's been under, uh, undergone a couple of years back. And most new builds are, are fully built out using some sort of full mesh type of architecture. So a lot of reasons for this. Uh, some of it has to do with how subnets get created for virtualization, how subnets get created to be able to do convergence of both storage networks and uh, Ethernet using lightweight protocols like ROCE. And we're going to talk about that in some other discussions. But we have that mesh network. And in that mesh network, we really have two separate areas that get formulated inside the network. One, we have switch to switch. So this is shown in this diagram as that spine to leaf connection. These are longer runs. These are typically what we call infrastructure. They're built out once or they're built out in chunks and they're pre-built ahead of compute going in. So we have different losses for this type of uh, area in the network. So things like loss, reach, and fiber count cable count. These are huge things. So the fiber, the number of strands of fiber actually become a pretty significant player in the cost side of the equation. So when we look at MPO24 and 100 gig SR10, it really struggled because the cable cost was way too high in this part of the network. So we need to burden the transceiver costs a little more and get the fiber count down a little bit in this part of the network. The other part of the network that's between the leaf switch and the servers in this picture. And this is really what we call that those top of rack or within the rack type of connectivity. So we're staying in a cabinet or a rack. We're not going long reaches, but we have different challenges here. This is where we're connecting into the active gear, the compute equipment. So the blades, the servers, and this is usually done by a different group of people. This is usually handled by the IT staff on a day-to-day -day basis. So they have different challenges here. We don't have to worry about loss and reach. We don't have multiple connection points. We're not trying to implement things like shuffles and cross connects. These are really active to active type of connections. This is patching day to day. So we're worried about power. How do we get the power down on the protocol? Can we do anything on the connectivity side? Can we minimize the link? We have shorter links. We can actually reduce the power to support this. Uh, we have higher density. We need smaller cables, more flexible cables, more pliable cables. We need to be able to get in there with our fingers and do that work with the connectors every day. And we have a cleaning problem on this side of the equation. The day-to-day -day IT staff is usually not spending the same amount of time and effort cleaning that the, that the infrastructure teams are doing. So we have challenges there and we need our connectivity to be more robust for this problem. So where does that bring us? Where are we going to go in the near future for ter in terms of connectivity? Well, we have two very different types of connectors emerging. We're going to start with the MXC. This is addressing that top of rack type of architecture or part of the network that inner rack connectivity, the compute connectivity. So this is a high throughput type of connector. You're going to see one to four rows, 16 fibers a row. That's 64 fibers per fer or ferrule. That's a lot of throughput here. It's a short reach type of device. This is really a patch cord. It's meant to go from active to active. So we're going to see this from switch to server in a top of rack type of connection, or we're going to see this used for compute disaggregation. What's different about this type of connector is it's going to use micro-lensed optics. So what we're doing with a micro-lensed optic is we actually expand the size of the core in the connector to make that connector-to-connector -connector connection. And it's a non-contact type of connection, unlike traditional fiber connectors. This means it's much more robust to dirt and debris. We're not going to see the types of issues because of lack of cleaning that we see on the MPO world. However, we are going to see much higher losses from this type of connector, closer to 1 dB. So a very different methodology for connecting in this part of the world. The other side is the MPO 1632 that's emerging right now. And this is going to go after those future generation protocols. When we start talking about optimizing 100 gig SR4 and 400 gig and anything beyond that, we're looking at MPO 16. Here, we're really going to be seeing one or two rows and again, 16 fibers per row. We're going to see traditional polished end faces. So very much what we're used to in the MPO world today, but they're going to be cleaning sensitive. You're going to need to make sure these are very clean. These, But we can get very low loss connections out of these. So we can do longer reach. We can do high point count topologies. We can do zone distribution, cross connects, optical shuffles. We can introduce a lot of those concepts that help manage the cable plant a lot better. And then we can do longer reach, switch to switch kind of length. So 10 meters to 100 meter type of reach. That should wrap it up for today. I hope this gives you a little bit of insight in terms of 
where the future of fiber connectivity is going and what are the real drivers behind those trends and what's changing uh, our current connector designs. If you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to reach out to us or any one of our Abeldon Associates and we'd be glad to talk you through it. Thank you.